ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Atlantic's Editor-in-Chief, Jeffrey Goldberg. Hi. You want to come? Oh, you might as well. Hello, oh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, it's been a long day. Um, since we last met, um, Nancy Pelosi announced that they're going to impeach the president. <laughs> Fast-moving events. Fast-moving events. Um, I just wanted to say uh, um, uh, one word about um, the, the, the folks on the stage right now. And uh, but before I do that, I want to say a word about you. Um, in, in this crowd are some of our most loyal readers and subscribers. Um, as you know, for many reasons, this isn't the easiest time in American history for journalism enterprises like The Atlantic that are trying to do, as best as we can, quality journalism work in a very tumultuous and fractured age. Um, and so I'm very, very deeply appreciative to everything that you do to support quality journalism, particularly our quality journalism. But if you have to subscribe to other things, that's fine. Just know your priorities. Get your priorities straight. Um, I really appreciate that very much. And I'm hoping that you're enjoying the festival. Um, I'm going to turn it over in one second to my colleague, Adrian LaFrance, who is our executive editor. Um, and one of my closest colleagues and, and friends. Um, and uh, Adrian is going to be in conversation um, with uh, a legend, a living legend. Can I say that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to say it. <laughs> a living legend. Um, Jamel, you know, when, when um, Jamel, um, what's, the, what's, the, what's the correct euphemism, became available um, to other... <laughs> When Jamel became available to other uh, journalism outlets in America, um, Adrian and I both, I mean, this is, this is actually true, because um, we're a truth-based organization. Um, Adrian and I looked at each other and we're like, let's get Jamel Hill to write for The Atlantic. Um, luckily, they had a, they had a Michi which Michigan was it? Oh, that see, that uh, don't funny. even Michigan State connection. <laughs> there are apparently two universities in Michigan, and one you can't mention in this crowd. Right. Um, uh, and they knew each other a little bit, and um, one thing led to another. We wound up the three of us having breakfast. Almost immediately understood that the Atlantic would be a great natural home for Jamel. We were proven absolutely correct. Um, she's doing extraordinary work for us um, at the intersection of sports and culture and politics and economics and race and gender. Uh, I, I, you're going to talk about a bunch of fascinating topics, all of which she's addressed just in the last few weeks. She's really been on a tear. Um, Jamel has her first uh, piece in our print magazine this month, which I hope you talk about, the HBCU piece. Um, and um, she's just been doing great work, as has Adrian. So with that, I will turn it over to my dear colleagues, Adrian and Jamel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction, and thank you all so much for being here. Um, Jamal, impeachment. Let's talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll note that moments ago when we were waiting to come out here that Jamal noticed that the president has tweeted, um, and the tweet is, in all caps, presidential harassment, exclamation point. Um, <laughs> And I raise this just because I think it's good for Americans to know what the president is tweeting here and there. But also, um, you have some personal experience with with Twitter and... Uh, oh, I thought you were going to say with the president. And President <laughs> Trump, too. both, both. Yeah. So, I mean, what's your... To first, maybe tell that story and sort of what how surreal that experience was. Well, um, a long, long time ago, back in 2017, um, I uh, tweeted what I thought Everybody knew, which is that the president is a white supremacist. I thought everybody kind of had agreed on that. But apparently there was still a huge segment of people who did not agree that that was the case. And it caused a, a really big firestorm. And um, I was talked about on a bunch of uh, different news channels. And one of the favorite stories I like to tell is when I walked into one of my favorite restaurants, uh, I was actually being talked about on three different networks. And it was like Fox, MSNBC, and CNN at all at the same time. And I was like, wow, this is really awkward. Um, but so, um, you know, that kind of, I guess, exploded my profile. There were a segment of people who knew me from my work at ESPN, because at the time I was hosting the 6 o'clock Sports Center. This happens. Um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders calls for me to be fired. The president tweets about me, and you know, next thing, you know, um, my life was upset a little bit. Um, 
a lot of times people just come up to me and ask me, are the Patriots going to win the AFC East again? <laughs> and But now they're asking me a lot about the president and racism and all this other stuff sort of post the tweeting episode. So it, it did throw my life into a bit of a, um, you know, tornado for a little while. And, you know, eventually it just kind of became obvious to me that it was sort of, it was time to leave ESPN. I had been there for 12 years. I had a great time there. It's the, it was a great job. And it, the journalist that I was when I started versus the one I was when I left, totally different um, journalist. Uh, I, I left an improved, versatile journalist. But it was time for me to go because I wanted to write more and dig down deeper into what Jeff talked about, the intersections between race, sports, politics, gender, all of those things. Uh, because as much as there are some people who act as if sports is not political, that's just simply not the case. And it has never been the case throughout the history of sports. So I wanted to be able to write about that in a way that was unapologetic, in a way in which I didn't have to worry about who the network was partnered with. Um, didn't have to worry about um, keeping a lot of people happy in the corporate environment uh, and to be able to freely speak about these topics. And so when I had that breakfast with Jeff and Adrian, um, you know, I immediately knew that the Atlantic was was where I needed to be. So, you know, for me, um, a lot of people are it's, it's just funny. It was surreal. This occurred to me watching the debates is that how people just openly just call the president a racist, like very casually, like, oh, yeah, you know, our racist president is like, wow. So we've arrived at that point. So much like, you know, I guess if you want to give me the credit of being one of the first to say it, but I always correct people and say, no, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, ta -Nehisi was the first person to say it and write about it. In fact, I blame him, really, because that's what partly got me fired up, is reading that article. <laughs> and, and much like, uh, again, um, uh, we were just talking about uh, Yoni's piece about, the, about impeachment, which... This was uh, the cover story we had, and I believe it was March. It was um, March. Yeah. So the... I just retweeted it. So yes, I, I, I tweeted it as well. <laughs> And then to have Nancy Pelosi here today. So this, say, this just is further proof. The Atlantic always on the forefront telling you today's news yesterday. <laughs> so, um, no, my general reaction is like nobody can be surprised that we have, and, and to be honest, this probably should have happened a while ago. Uh, it's funny because already I see the narrative being spun on Twitter that this was a uh, part of Nancy Pelosi's master plan. Uh, though this is not a perfect analogy, it kind of reminded me to some degree of when people were giving Antonio Brown the credit for having the master plan of going to the Patriots. I'm not sure if she meant it to come to this, because I really think if not forced to, act to finally take action, I'm not sure if we, if we get to this point. I want to get to Antonio Brown in a minute and sports generally. But first, you talked about sports having always been political. What is it about this moment where there's sort of this indignation and trying, you know, there's a, a vocal population of people who try to insist it shouldn't be? And I'm just curious for your read on what, what that's about, whether it's purely just escapism or wanting to control who's speaking up. Um, uh, tell me, where, do you, where does this impulse come from? I think it's both of those things. Uh, the tone in the country right now, I think, has a lot to do with why you're, one, seeing athletes feel more um, activated and feel more a sense of an obligation to use their platforms to discuss racial, social, um, racial and social uh, injustices, to discuss political issues, is because they see what's happening. And um, the other part of it is that because of what's happening, people are now leaning more into escapism. They want for a brief moment not to be reminded that the country's on fire. And sometimes watching a football game or watching a basketball game provides them that sense of relief. So when they go there and they're still reminded that the country's on fire, they get really pissed off about it. Um, and then there's also another uh, angle to this and that is the fact that, generally speaking, I chart how people react to an athlete being quote unquote political based off whether they, whether they agree with said athlete. Uh, I bring this up all the time. Uh, who remembers when Tim Tebow and his mom were in a pro-life ad a couple years ago that ran during the Super Bowl, right? You didn't hear a whole lot of people saying stick to sports. And that's not to suggest they're not pro-choice people that were not you know, maybe outraged on some level or people didn't have their own opinions. But there was never this idea that Tim Tebow shouldn't be allowed to voice, um, you know, his beliefs. You know, you fast forward to 
Colin Kaepernick, obviously the most current and glowing example of how different that temperature can be read. And, you know, whenever we see it happen all the time, whenever we discuss police brutality and racism, it turns into a debate. And the fact of the matter is there's a lot of people who don't agree that how the police treat people of color is a bad thing. As horrible as that may sound, but there's everybody's not in agreement on that one. And so the reaction to him has been a lot different and it's cost him his career and he's never gonna play in the NFL again because of the stance that he took. So a lot of it has to do with that and there's just a number of examples throughout history of black athletes whenever they have chosen to, spo to speak out and to frankly remind people of their blackness who look to them for entertainment, there's always a tension and there's always a pushback to that. I mean, it goes back, you know, Muhammad Ali, after he was proven to be on the right side of history, became a hero to a lot of people. During the, you know, uh, thick of it, there was not a lot of agreement. They, right, if you look back at coverage from that oh, time, it's totally. much, so much there's, different. there's a lot of criticism. So we've always kind of been in this vortex. I mean, it's interesting that this week the Olympic Committee is inducting, uh, you know, Tommy Smith and John Carlos into the Hall of Fame. For years, they were disgraced by the Olympic Committee, not supported, not recognized. And 50-something years later, they finally decide, oh, wait, maybe speaking about against racial oppression wasn't so bad. So uh, that's why in these moments where the outcome hasn't been decided, I always encourage people to think about what they're saying and how that might look 20 years from now. Because believe me, 20 years from now, there's going to be a whole lot of people changing their stories on Colin Kaepernick. What's your sense um, of which professional league? I mean, my, it, it seems like the NFL is by far the toughest on people speaking out. Is that your sense? And what is it about the NBA that is it just like players having more power generally in the NBA? Um, um, guaranteed contracts. <laughs> You'd be surprised how much empowerment that that gives uh, a professional athlete. In the NBA, the contracts are all guaranteed. And the NFL, they are not. And the system of the NFL is very owner-friendly. It's owner-dominated. And frankly, a big part of the reason why they're empowered to, in many ways, suppress the players is because of the fans. I mean, fans, it's unbelievable to me, but fans side with owners more than players. They feel like they have more in common with the people who own the teams than the people who play, which is very interesting to me. Um, some of that is fantasy football, which we can, that would be a whole nother discussion <laughs> if we got into that. So uh, I think the system of the NFL and just football in general, you, you know, anybody who's played football, whether you became a professional or not, they will tell you that the mantra of football is to decrease, suppress, and get rid of an individuality for conformity and team. And so a lot of players and the league itself has that feel to it of everybody has to be uniform, everybody has to be on the same page. You know, one team, one fight. And while those sound like very good principles, but when it comes to expressing individuality or if you have a counter opinion to that culture, you're going to be cast out as an outsider. In, in the NBA, just the game itself lends itself to individual expression. One player can change a whole franchise. You know, LeBron James, in one moment, he brought Cleveland to its highest height. In another moment, he sunk the franchise. And it's going to take a while for them to get out of that. And then you see now what he's done with the Lakers. Um, so uh, I just think that the, the players have much more power. They have guaranteed contracts. Um, and I also think leadership is a lot different. Uh, they have more younger owners. You know, you have a Mark Cuban. You have Michael Jordan, who is an owner. Um, you also have the fact that, you know, Adam Silver is considered to be one of the most progressive uh, commissioners in professional sports in tandem with having Michelle Roberts, uh, you know, who is head of the, the players union. And because you have, you know, a, a black woman and a lot of diversity and just their sense and tone of things. And you have, frankly, their best player, LeBron James, who is as outspoken and vocal as anybody. I mean, I think, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, he had the most retweeted tweet in sports and one of the 10 most retweeted tweets when he called the president a bum. <laughs> you bum. Not even the full Y-O-U, just the you. <laughs> 
So when you have that, it's it's the league is just going to have a much different feel to it than say the the NFL. Well, I think to your point about um, in the NFL, sort of this culture of suppressing individualism, that also has implications for when someone might be held accountable for something. Um, talk a little bit about, about the Antonio Brown situation. Oh, oh my gosh. I mean, I, I, he might as well have withdrawn all his money from the bank and lit it on fire. That's the equivalent of what he did. And it was interesting that he went, as I wrote about in The Atlantic, um, which you can go to at theatlantic.com. <laughs> Um, he, um, you know, the NFL, as we've seen many times before, they will give countless chances to people who are accused of or who have even done some pretty horrible things, especially as it relates to violence towards women. The only thing you can't do in the NFL is take a knee. That's what you can't do, but you can do a whole bunch of other stuff that they are happy to let uh, you get away with or overlook or just put a number of games, you have to be suspended and then everybody can move on. And, um, you know, Antonio Brown, uh, he was a problem in Pittsburgh and Mike Tomlin certainly looks like the coach of the year after now that we've seen a little bit more and been exposed to a little bit more of who Antonio Brown really is. He quit on them. Um, and then, you know, of course, he made his way to the Raiders and all he had to do was show up for work and couldn't really seem to do that with any degree of consistency. And then, of course, you know, the Patriots in many ways have become last chance you. Because if anybody knows, if you're willing to blow the opportunity to play with the greatest quarterback ever, don't debate me or at me. Um, <laughs> if you blow that chance to play with Tom Brady and then uh, one of the greatest coaches of all time, and there's pretty much a sense that there is no hope for you. And so people have to remember, as I pointed out in the piece, you know, after the Patriots, who did not know that he had the civil suit in which he was accused of rape, they still kept him. He still played in the uh, blowout of the Dolphins. So they were more than willing to let this blow over or watch what happens with the NFL investigation until he did the one thing any lawyer would tell you not to do, not to threaten the person who accused you of sexual harassment, which is exactly what he did. And so finally it left the Patriots without a choice and they had to release him. And so well, without a choice because they were trying to protect themselves. Correct. And they were trying to, so it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a choice. By the way, of, Tom Brady's overrated. <laughs> <laughs> she said that. I had to. By the way, this is Eagles fan here. <laughs> Go so. Context. <laughs> All right. But you can say, hey, you got a Super Bowl, right? So you, you can you can crawl a little bit. Um, but no, I mean, he, uh, the Patriots didn't have a choice because of that. It wasn't because they were trying to make some moral decision about finally being done with Antonio Brown's antics. It was, it, it was a question of his availability and a question of their liability. And that was that. And that's the way the NFL works. So when he goes on this Twitter tirade pointing out Ben Roethlisberger, who was twice accused of rape and served a four-game suspension, um, which feels always odd to say. Um, and, you know, Robert Kraft, the owner of the Patriots, who has a pending uh, solicitation charge for prostitution against him right now. And he's saying, hey, it didn't cost them their careers. Well, it probably won't cost them his. I fully expect that Antonio Brown will be playing in the NFL again. Next season, or I don't know if it'll happen this season, but next season because he's one, he's too good. Um, you know, he's one of the best receivers. Some would make the case he's the best wide receiver in the league. And two, as the league has shown repeatedly, they don't really care about violence toward women. So that adds up to me. He will play because some team will t will kick the tires, and NFL teams always think, "Oh, he acted that way there. I can fix him." That's always their mentality. Jeff mentioned the piece that you wrote uh, about the, the argument you made about historically black colleges and universities. Talk a little bit about that. And I'm curious, too, for your sense of the response to it, which <laughs> I'm sure you anticipated, but yeah, we'll get to that. So t You know, I'll be, I'll be honest, I actually did not anticipate Tucker that. Tucker Carlson was mad. <laughs> what? I pissed him <laughs> off. What? I mean, I, you know, I thought he, I thought he was as pro-segregation as anybody. <laughs> 
I so, mean, every night he's complaining that the country is too black and brown. So I thought he'd be good if we just went off on our own and did our own thing. I'm trying well, to help him out. <laughs> outline, outline the argument for folks who haven't read it yet. <laughs> so I wrote a piece about um, what HBCUs might look like and just making the case for you know, top tier black athletes instead of going to predominantly white universities to return to HBCUs. Um, there's certainly uh, a lot of incredible historically black colleges and universities. However, they have uh, issues when it comes to funding. You know, the facilities are not the same. There's, you know, it, it was sort of the unintended price of integration, what has happened to HBCUs. And you look at, you know, I think I pointed this out in a piece, like Prairie View has an athletic budget of like $18 million, which is among the highest, if not the highest, I think, of all the HBCUs. Alabama's budget is almost $200 million, right? So uh, you have a situation in college football, college basketball, the majority of the athletes are black. They have turned college football and college basketball into billion dollar industries. They have pumped millions of dollars into these universities and oh, by the way, are being exploited in the process. So what if <laughs> we took somebody um, like Zion Williamson, and instead of going to Duke, he went to Howard, or if he went to Hampton, or if, and what that might look like for those schools uh, who would then obviously get a lot more media exposure. Suddenly, uh, people tend to open their checkbooks when they see there are a place can attract athletic talent, and when they see the sports teams do well. You know, you look at a lot of new buildings on some of these campuses, and they are built because people love sports. And not just from rebuilding those HBCUs, I mean, despite the fact that, yeah, they have suffered a lot um, post-integration, the, it's still a significant number of black professionals that come from HBCUs. I mean, you see this year, the, you know, Kamala Harris is running for president, a Howard graduate. So they still have very much been a bedrock of the black community, uh, but they need better support. And the easiest way to do that is if you can convince some of these athletes to um, return to HBCUs. So as part of the response, there were, as you might imagine, a lot of HBCU graduates who were very happy to see this. This is something that many of them have talked about among themselves for years, so they were kind of happy to see somebody um, do some critical thinking behind it. But there was also a group of people who called me a racist and a segregationist, one of which was Tucker Carlson, which Okay. <laughs> and uh, sort of as a response piece that um, I wrote and um, is interesting because you often hear conservatives tell people of color how we need to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and how we need to fix our communities. Well, that's what I was suggesting. So why they bitch it, <laughs> right? That you take the black talent, put it back in the black school and watch the community as a whole benefit. But now all of a sudden, I guess when, you know, uh, they thought about how this might impact Texas and Alabama and Oklahoma and all these other schools, suddenly they want to be around us. <laughs> so it was, they, that, that part, I, honestly, I never expected to be called a segregationist. That was new. It was so, a first. Yeah, it was a first. I was <laughs> proud. <laughs> um, so in addition to a very persuasive argument making the case for this, how, what, what's sort of the first step? Like, how do you actually take this from being an idea into making it happen? Because for the first few athletes who make that move, there's some risk, right? Or Yeah, it is. Uh, because again, as I won't, I won't lie to you, the facilities are not the same. Um, you know, the level of support that those programs receive at HBCUs is not the same that you might get at Duke or any of the other big name programs. But I think it will take, uh, you know, conscious decision making to do it. And matter of fact, as a teaser, of a piece that is, I think it may post either tomorrow or the day after, because there um, is a very highly rated uh, prep basketball player that is going to be visiting a HBCU on an official visit. So I have that story. So there's a tease. <laughs> so it's um, uh, so it's already something that I think a lot of a lot more people are conscious of. And I should also add to, and this was a part of the original piece that I wrote, is that um, you know, given what the tone of this country is right now, there are a lot of parents of these athletes and the athletes themselves who are concerned about going to certain campuses and 
from just a um, emotional standpoint what that might be like and that in terms of their development it might be better for them to be in an environment where you see people that look like you everywhere and um, that is not to say that I'm not advocating that we become a, a, a separate society. That's what that wasn't what I was advocating at all. And oh, by the way, white people go to HBCUs. I don't know if they that was also apparent that a lot of people did not know that. <laughs> like HBCUs have never been segregated. Texas, not so much. But um, yeah, they've never been segregated. And in fact, you know, if you go and look at a, a lot of the sports teams at HBCUs, you will find a number of white athletes. They get scholarships to HBCUs, so it's not segregated. So white people, you can come. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, I, I do think that there is some concern about instilling a certain amount of, um, you know, not just making sure their kids have a, a, a certain amount of, of history and understanding of their own history, American history, uh, as it relates to the black experience, but also, uh, being strong in their identity as they go out in a world where marginalized people are under attack. And I think that's, that's a very real fear for a lot of uh, black and brown parents. You talked about how much money schools make off of their athletes. And I wonder if to you at this point, the issue of potentially paying college athletes is totally straightforward. Is there any reason they shouldn't be paid? Where do you? It's completely straightforward. And in fact, HBCUs, uh, are in the best position to have that conversation. Um, the Washington Post, they did a poll on this, uh, uh, I think it was two years ago, where they polled people about whether or not they supported the idea of playing um, you know, uh, basketball and, and football players. And I know this is gonna shock you, but it was a racial divide. <laughs> the majority of African Americans supported paying players. The majority of white people did not, <laughs> and so, yeah. Did they, did, was there an indication of why? Like well, what the logic uh, was? There are, you know, yeah, that's another hour. But um, <laughs> there, I mean, there are definitely that the, there's this idea that the free tuition is an, is an, uh, is enough. And I hate the word free tuition because that implies you don't have to do anything for it. Right. But yeah, you have to practice for it and essentially play on pretty much a professional schedule. Um, in order to get this scholarship, which is not a four-year scholarship. They are year-to-year -year renewables. And the story that never gets written is about the number of coaches that rip scholarships to make room for other players at the end of the season. They do this all the time. So it's one-year renewables. So every year, you have to prove that you have to, you know, that you're worth staying on the team because that scholarship can be taken from you at any moment in addition to the fact the scholarship does not cover the total cost of college. And so it's a little bit of a difficult pill to swallow if you're an athlete and you see your face on all the marketing campaigns and your jersey being sold for $70 in the store and you're not allowed to make anything. Everybody else is allowed to make money, the coach, the administrators, everyone else but you. And I think at the very least, um, the easiest way to immediately figure it out is allow athletes to make as much money as they possibly can on their own image and likeness and name. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, it's an Olympic model. That means it is a free market system. So, yeah, if you're not the star of the team, uh, you may not make as much. But, okay, guess what? The star of the team is going to get more playing time than you anyway. So it's not like it's an equitable system where everybody plays the same amount of minutes, everybody plays the same amount of plays. And for those who are worried about, oh, well, you know, if they, they know they can make more money if they go to uh, Georgia or Clemson versus if they go to Ball State. Well, guess what? Georgia and Clemson got a better program than Ball State right now. Right now. So what difference does it make? There's inequity in college sports. That's a part of it. So now all of a sudden everybody wants everything to be equal and to use that as an excuse not to pay these guys. But if the NCAA doesn't figure something out, somebody's going to break the system. And it's just a matter of do they want to get ahead of it or do they want to keep uh, pretending as if this isn't going to be an issue um, and, you know, frankly, lean into their own greed. But at some point it will because one of the things that a group of investors is suggesting is that the HBCUs create their own pay-for-play league and completely leave the NCAA behind. Well, what I was going to say, in terms of going pro, I mean, that's also like the vast majority of college athletes are never going to go pro, and right. yet every single, well, the vast majority of them come in hoping that that's the case. And so they have this very short window of time in which they can 
capitalize on or get paid for their athletic prowess. Yeah, I mean, you may not be, you may not wind up being a, a you know, a Hall of Famer or going to a great professional career, but if you're in college and you're the man or you're the woman, you can make a lot of money. I mean, and not to mention, I think for female athletes, it's a really good thing because there's a lot of campuses where there's a lot of female athletes who are quite popular. Think about it, if you're uh, a woman that plays for the UConn women's team, what you could probably make, right? If they allowed you what Maya Moore could have made on her own name and likeness, or if you were Candace Parker or any of these programs or Brittany Griner, like you could have made a lot of money on your name. So at least when by the time you leave and you graduate, you have something, even if you don't have a Hall of Fame professional career. All right, we're going to take some questions. I'm guessing I see one back here. I think we have mics, maybe. Oh, yep. There's. Hi, thank you, I'm Leon Peace. My question is, what can you suggest, or how can Michigan State University regain its status and reputation? Yeah, that is not a plan. Those, I do not know this man. <laughs> no, 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 those That's a of really us, important question. It those is. of us from uh, Case Hall on the... Uh, oh, Case Hall, what? what? Go green. <laughs> now, you said how can Michigan State restore... Yeah, it's, it's reputation. Oh, after everything that happened with Larry Nassar, right. Um, so for those who weren't aware, I mean, I'm sure you probably saw the news, but Michigan State was uh, deservedly so. Um, uh, you know, they... It was a, one of the biggest scandals in... in uh, not just school history, I mean, it's probably the biggest scandal in school history, but just, you know, period for any college or university, uh, a, a former, um, uh, was he a, he wasn't a trainer, oh, gymnastics, it was gymnastics, he was a doctor, sorry, he was a former gymnastics doctor, um, you know, was convicted and will be buried and die in jail, thankfully, because of uh, the number of female gym, gymnasts that he violated, including some that were Olympians. Uh, later on. So, you know, Michigan State, uh, the leadership to be failed on every single level. And I think the only way that they can restore the reputation is by uh, not just, you know, reinstalling good leadership. I mean, we just, just uh, there's a new president now at Michigan State. Um, but I, I hesitate, hesitate to, to say, oh, should this happen again? They need to, you know, be better prepared. It shouldn't even happen. It should have never gotten that far to begin with. And so my hope is that for those who, uh, not just the, the survivors of what Larry Nassar did, but uh, just being on a campus and how they address you know, rape culture and sexual assault with women, I hope that they have really strengthened their practices and made it a more um, comfortable environment to protect, you know, women, frankly. And I will say this, when I, I went, I went there shortly after he was sentenced and the mood on campus, what I was proud of was that there, a lot of students and administrators were very angry at how Michigan State handled it. Nobody was, um, at all trying to excuse the behavior of what happened just because, you know, we're all Spartans. And so I was proud that the students and the administrators really stood up uh, to the people in charge and let them know this wasn't acceptable. So um, I think they're getting there. I mean, I don't know if, honestly, that scandal was so pervasive. I don't know if it's something you ever get over and that you're ever not reminded of. But I do hope it is a reminder of what could happen when people choose to stay silent and protect a name as opposed to actual people. Up front. Hi, yeah, you spoke at the beginning Thank you. Hi. You spoke at the beginning um, about John Carlos and Tommy Smith, who are being recognized rightfully, finally. Um, and at the same time, the USOC just punished athletes who protested at the Pan American Games. Um, and they'll be sitting a, sus a suspension that'll take them out, actually, of the Tokyo Games. And so I'm curious how you think we get to a point where athletes, at the moment that they make a, a protest, are affirmed and valued and celebrated for that. It doesn't take 50 years. It doesn't. So it isn't something we look back on, um, but that in that moment, we celebrate athletes. Uh, pessimistic answer, unfortunately. I don't think we'll ever learn that lesson, because we shouldn't. People thought after what we have seen from athletes who have spoken out and lost their careers going back you know, they're like somebody like Kurt Flood, who is the reason that free agency exists in sports, and it cost him his career for speaking up 
on behalf of athletes and, and what he was worth. You think when those situations happen, we learn. We never learn. And unfortunately, it will be repeated. And you see how quickly it was repeated, despite the fact, as you just pointed out, um, the athlete who took a knee at the, the Pan American Games is, is facing punishment. And unfortunately, there just is a lot of resistance to athletes using their platform to speak to something broader because uh, it makes a lot of people uncomfortable, which, I don't know, I thought that was the whole point of a, a protest, right? Um, people keep trying to find these ways in which everybody agrees with the protest or it's, it's uh, you know, that is, is something that we can all sit and say, hey, yes, let's all protest and we let's all agree together. It's never happened. So you would think at the very least we wouldn't create a system where you get punished be, because you do it. I mean, Colin Kaepernick's career should not have been taken from him. We already learned that lesson, supposedly, but we didn't. So uh, unfortunately, it's gonna continue to happen. And that's why I admire the athletes who decide to do it because they know ultimately what it may cost them and they decide to do it anyway. And um, we just have to, in hindsight, wind up feeling embarrassed about it. So I wish I had a more optimistic answer. I don't because I just don't ever see a structure that's set up to support athletes who do that that visibly. They're fine to help them if they, you know, want to do charity work on the side or charity away from whatever is their event. They probably will never support an athlete doing that on a world stage like that or any stage because they feel like it interferes with the event they're trying to hold. Is there any world in which Kaepernick plays again? Nope. Care to elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the owners have made up their mind. As you see, they are, you know, they're probably called Shane Falco before they call Colin Kaepernick. That was a replacement line for those who <laughs> didn't get it. <laughs> um, no, the owners are dug in. They're not going to, they, um, I don't even think it, it's about people worried about him being a distraction. I think it has everything to do with spite and pettiness because they blame Colin Kaepernick for how the league wound up in the crosshairs of the president. They blame Colin Kaepernick for a couple years ago when NFL ratings were down. They blame him and not the fact that they still don't know what a catch is in the NFL. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so, um, so yeah, they, they blame him for a lot of that. And... I think they feel as if they need to make an example out of him. So should any player, uh, I would say should any quarterback, should anybody that visible in that position decide that's something they want to do, they will already have seen the consequence. So no, I don't expect him to play again. Even if there is, you know, part of the reason I think what kind of sealed his fate was definitely Donald Trump using him uh, as a pinata at, at rallies. But even if Donald Trump is not the president, I don't see any scenario in which uh, Colin Kaepernick gets a chance uh, to play again. I hope I'm wrong, but I just don't see it. Other questions? Right up here. Thank you. Thank you, Jamel. Big fan of yours and so happy you have a platform now where you can talk um, across the breadth of your interests. So one comment and one question. The comment, an author, Glennon Doyle, talks about um, people saying, don't ask me if you would have marched with Martin Luther King. Ask me if you are marching with Colin Kaepernick. And I think that's what we have to ask ourselves now. So in 20 years, we don't all realize way, we were on the wrong side of that, because not everyone supported Martha, Martin Luther King. I'd love for you to talk about um, gender pay parity Ooh, yeah. and what we this need is one to of our do favorites. Um, going forward to make that more of a reality. Well, uh, we're talking about in sports. I mean, we, we could talk about it in society, because that's obviously an issue regardless. But I'll just stick to sports, I guess. Um, that's a, I know. That's not what they mean when they yeah, say I know. sports. <laughs> I'll just apply it to sports. How about that? Uh, that's going to be a huge issue. Um, you know, the WNBA's collective bargaining agreement, I believe, is up. And it's not that, this is the part I thought got lost when people were um, attacking a lot of female athletes for speaking out about their pay is, you know, of course, it's always seen through the specter of what men make. And I don't think any of the WNBA players were saying that their number one pick needed to make as much as LeBron James. What they were saying is that for what they bring in, um, for what they sacrifice, 
for the fact that they essentially have to have multiple jobs just to play in the WNBA. You know, a lot of them play overseas when the season is over. Um, I just had Candace Parker on my podcast, and she's not only she's not only played overseas, but she has a job at TNT as a broadcaster. They have to do multiple things to supplement they, their income. They shouldn't have to do all those things. I mean, the broadcasting part aside, but playing overseas, um, you know, the WNBA is, uh, by having its best players feel like they have to do that, they're also jeopardizing their product because it just happened. I mean, Brianna Stewart got hurt playing overseas, was done for the season, their MVP. And so unless they want those scenarios to continue, uh, which will take away from the star power that they can market here, they have to figure out a way to better compensate you know, those women. Um, and really at the root of the conversation that they're having in sports is not unlike the ones that they are having in society. Uh, there is just this idea in sports that women just don't deserve as much. And uh, it's really, even the women's uh, national soccer team, which we know is so much better than the men, <laughs> so much better. They're, you know, a, a big draw here. They, all those arguments that people have about why women shouldn't be paid, they meet and surpass those arguments. And yet they still are having to fight for what they're worth. It's, it's part of a, a societal failure. Unfortunately, it's a societal mentality. And I'm happy that the women's national team is picking up that fight because they have to, not just for them, but for the other women that are watching and for other leagues. The good thing is that I feel really confident um, that they're equipped for the fight because one thing, and it's part of the reason why uh, the activism that you've seen from female athletes um, is just innate to them. You know, look, before they started doing certain things in the NBA, it was the Minnesota Lynx that wore T-shirts and talked openly about what happened to Philando Castillo. Um, it was them. And so much so that the police officers who uh, worked their games refused to work them anymore because of what they said about police brutality. And in talking to them, they're prepared for that fight because they've had to fight for respect and dignity and equality their entire careers. So the good thing is this is nothing new. And so I think they're going to accomplish a lot, but I'd really love to see the WNBA in particular be a leader in this area, given why the league was created, given the female leadership in the, the front office and the C-suites. They have a chance to do something that hasn't been done in professional sports uh, for women, and I hope that they use that opportunity. Other questions right up front here? I'll get some from the back next, I promise. <laughs> What do you think about Jay-Z and <laughs> Another thing I wrote about. She wrote a great piece about that. <laughs> no, but I just want her to talk about it. <laughs> yes. No, I'm glad you asked in me. In general or in the context I love of these, the NFL? Yeah, right? Exactly. I love these free plugs. <laughs> also, you could check it out on theatlantic.com. <laughs> so uh, Jay-Z went into partnership with the NFL uh, to be a curator of their big events, including the Super Bowl and also to help them amplify some of their social justice initiatives. So funny that before Colin Kaepernick, they didn't care a thing about social justice. Now all of a sudden they do. Um, so I was critical of the partnership for a, a number of reasons. Uh, this is the same Jay-Z who wore Colin Kaepernick's jersey when he performed on Saturday Night Live. Him and Beyonce have been very vocal about their support of Colin Kaepernick. And the reason I didn't love the partnership isn't because um, I don't think you, no one should ever work with the NFL again. It's mostly because I felt as if the NFL got way more out of this than Jay-Z got out of it. Um, he's already got a lot of money. That's not to say more can't be made, so I'm not trying to check his pockets. But it is to say that the notice what happened with the NFL Super Bowl halftime show the last couple of years. It's created a lot of controversy. I mean, they had a very difficult find, time finding a Super Bowl act this year. Many numerous black entertainers, including Rihanna, who made it known why she did, because she supported Colin Kaepernick, turned them down. And what it did was uh, it not only, um, they not only lost, ac lost access to a certain group of black entertainers, the ones that they did find suddenly had to answer questions about why they were performing and why they were 
uh, sort of turning their back on Colin Kaepernick. And they didn't want that either because the week of the Super Bowl became the Colin Kaepernick show. And they knew they had to get rid of that. And if you go back and look um, at a New York Times piece that was done when they talked about some of these owner and player meetings that they were having, trying to figure out how to solve the protest, they were very clear about what their objective was. They wanted to find a face to put on the protest that wasn't Colin Kaepernick so that they could move the protest off the field. They made that very clear. That's what their mission was. And he helped them with that. They, I mean, he wrapped it. He didn't need the Super Bowl. He didn't need the NFL. What happened? <laughs> right? Because I think it, there was something to be said for continuing to make the NFL, frankly, wallow in its own shame of what they've done to Colin Kaepernick. That was a powerful tool to have. And so now, because he has decided to have this partnership with them, that means probably a lot of the artists that he represents, a lot of the artists who want to work with him or just are friends with him, they suddenly will feel okay about doing the Super Bowl halftime act, which is what the NFL wanted. Uh, Jay-Z does not need the NFL to amplify social justice initiatives. He was doing a lot on his own. Uh, you know, he's got documentaries on Khalif Browder, Trayvon Martin. He's done a lot of really good work in that space. Again, they needed him, not the other way around. So why give it to him? For what? And the only thing that happened is maybe the NFL didn't plan on this, but I'm sure they certainly, um, you know, I'm sure they certainly didn't mind the fact that the only person who took bullets in that situation was Jay-Z, not them. And that's exactly what they wanted. Their whole goal and mission is to erase Colin Kaepernick from the picture. They don't want to be reminded that his career has essentially been destroyed. They do not want to be reminded of their role in it. And as they call themselves getting deeper into some of these social justice causes, they want to take his face and imprint off of that, as if they would, again, have been interested in it to begin with if it weren't for him. So it just, to me, was a bad look for Jay-Z. Um, I thought it was unnecessary. And, um, you know, everybody kept saying, well, maybe this is about NFL ownership. There, unless you get 50%, and there's nobody's 50% that is open, you don't have, ownership it can't be at play. It's not, you know, you can, I mean, I'll remind you that like Serena Williams, Mark Anthony, J-Lo are all NFL owners. They have one or 2%. <laughs> That's the most I could possibly see this ever winding up to be. And then you have to ask, was it worth it? All right, we have time for one more right here. Following up on that, what kind of retribution did you feel or experience from that? Um, from, from, from from the column about it, or yeah. Yeah. oh well, you know Jay Z got a lot of fans, man. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite the Bayhive, or you know the, but uh, he got a lot of fans and a lot of people because of the work that he's done in um, the black community. They were they wanted to they want to give him the benefit of the doubt, and I do think his intentions were good. I just think the NFL used him, and I just can't understand why he let them. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of backlash from fans and, of course, uh, you know, kind of what can be uncomfortable. And I think every black columnist honestly goes through this is when you criticize people who have become, um, you know, who have become kind of transcendent in your own community. That doesn't feel good to do. But nevertheless, sometimes it's necessary. And so it didn't feel good to have to, you know, criticize Jay-Z. Um, not just as a music fan, but just as somebody who has appreciated how he has been able to turn himself into this mogul and uh, somebody who is whose self determination, you know, you want to talk about a self made man. I mean, this is literally it. And so to have to be critical of him didn't feel good, but I felt like it needed to be said. That's a perfect note to end on. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Thank you for supporting the Atlantic. Thank you, Jamal.